So Dr. Bowman, we're going to start off with you. We have a couple questions for each of you, and then I'll give you a chance to like share anything that uh, you want to share to everybody here. But Dr. Bowman, you not only provide superior care to your patients, but you've also helped educate on prevention as well as owning our own health. What would be the three tips that you have on prevention? So, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Um, when we talk about prevention, we want to talk about risk factors and risk factors that we can change. Some things that we have no control over would be one, being a woman, two, our age, our race, or ethnicity, um, our family history, whether or personal history, whether it's a history of having cancer, of a gene mutation, or just having a high risk lesion. Um, one other thing you cannot change is if you have dense breast tissue or the age at which you start your period or the age at which you've gone through menopause. So those things we cannot change, but those are all concrete risk factors for breast cancer. Things that you can change, they're lifestyle modifications. So one is maintaining a healthy diet, exercising, reducing your alcohol intake, um, and limiting or avoiding hormone replacement therapy. We know that if you live a sedentary lifestyle, if you are not out in Piedmont Park or anywhere exercising, um, if you are eating foods that are high in fatty um, intake or lacking vegetables or fruit, that you're gonna have an increased risk for breast cancer. Frequent consumption of alcohol, meaning more than one glass per day, increases your risk for breast cancer. And if you use hormone replacement therapy, in particular combination, so that's estrogen and progesterone together, then that will increase your risk for breast cancer. So be active, make healthy choices. If you drink, drink in moderation and limit or avoid your hormone replacement therapy. And if it's recommended for you, ask your healthcare provider, what's your risk? Thank you, and Tanya, we want to get you on the conversation as well. I know we always want to educate everyone and express the importance of prevention. But we know breast cancer, like Dr. Duomo was saying, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't at all. Uh, what lifestyle changes would, did you make during your battle and afterwards? Uh, several changes. The, the first thing that I did was when I went to the doctor for my annual, I uh, made sure I took a copy of my blood work just to see what uh, nutrients or minerals that I may be lacking in. And uh, I started from there and then used that to start my plant-based diet or supplements, whatever uh, that I take on a daily basis. Do you have some of those that you'd like to share? I do. I had to bring my list because I didn't want to forget. But, um, sorry, I had to bring my list I didn't want to forget. Um, first of all, I, I, I make sure that I keep a regular monthly rotation of things, just water on a regular basis, make sure it's ionized with a pH balance that's as high as you can get. Um, detox supplements, just to keep flushing my system on a regular basis. And colonics, I do that once a month, as well as juicing with fruits and vegetables to get the nutrients that I need in the most natural form that I can. And sleep and meditation, of course, exercising four days a week. And meditation, of course, being whatever spiritual that you need to let go of, because a lot of times cancer is not just a physical thing, it's also an emotional uh, entrapment as well that we get home inside. And I know that a lot of people have probably heard like there are myths about breast cancer, about how you can get it, what to do, what not to do. Um, can you guys share some of those myths and kind of bust them a little bit? <laughs> I get asked about myths, or they are myths, questions about what causes breast cancer every day. I'm a breast cancer surgeon. So one thing I want to dispel, a couple things. Relaxers and hair dyes do not cause breast cancer. Deodorants and antiperspirants do not cause breast cancer. Placing your cell phone in your bra did not cause breast cancer. They are all myths. There is no evidence-based medicine. There are no studies that support that those are, that there's a connection between a risk of breast cancer and any of those things. There was an article produced last year that talked about the risk of breast cancer being increased with the use of hair dyes and relaxers. Um, there was one study, there is not enough information. The American Cancer Society and med many other medical boards do not support that. There is no connection, so you can still use those things. Um, cell phones are so big, I wouldn't place them in the bra right now, but <laughs> it's not gonna cause breast
has pants here. Neither is deodorant. One other myth I think is really important, particularly for um, this event, and you kind of touched on it, is that one might be too young to get breast cancer or be affected by breast cancer. Unfortunately, breast cancer does not discriminate based on age. We do see it more commonly in older women over 50, but more and more I'm seeing it in younger women. So if you feel something in your breast, if you notice a difference, if there's nipple discharge, if you just have a question, just think it doesn't seem right. Come and see your healthcare provider. Seek out an answer and don't just ignore it. Be your own health advocate. Well, one thing I definitely noticed on um, hormone levels, I overlooked that as well when I went through my treatment, but as I got my tumor tested, they noticed that I had a lot of hormones and a lot of progesterone, a lot of estrogen. So I would say definitely choose your meats, be very selective, try to get meats that are more grass-fed on the organic side. Make sure you shop at places that you know that they tend to take care of their meat. They don't just send them to slaughterhouses that are nasty and dirty but um, usually Sprouts, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, places like that. Publix have really clean meat as well, but those are just several tips for uh, eating meat. And Dr. Bowen, you kind of mentioned that you, know, you are a surgeon. You're a breast surgical oncologist. Uh, what is uh, one of the bigger and more most important things uh, that you want to pass on to our audience? Um, well, be your own health advocate, so always ask questions, always seek out an answer, don't ever just assume, that's number one. I think another kind of hot topic is about mammography, when to start it, what age you should start, and how often you should do, and the whole thing about dense breast tissue. Um, mammography is our gold standard for detecting for breast cancer. It detects 85% of breast cancers, it's not 100%, but it is the best modality we have. Um, what it does, it's an x-ray of the breast. So the American Cancer Society, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, the American College of Surgeons, we all promote and support the mammogram should start at age 40 for women of average risk, and it should continue annually. There's a lot of controversy about when you should start, how often you should go. Um, if you are at higher risk, and to determine if you're at high risk, it might be based off of your family history, uh, personal history, um, history of genes, but to determine that, you should seek the healthcare provider, in particularly a high risk clinic at a breast uh, center. Um, and then your age and starting in, in annual mammogram may be earlier than age 40, just based off of the, that information. So um, mammography is a hot topic in the breast world, and in particular, lots of uh, different organizations have put out when you should start it, and so it becomes controversial. So, but it is age 40 annually for average risk. If you're higher risk, it could be earlier than that. And then just one other thing is the thing about dense breast tissue, which is a big topic too now. I think people are hearing more about dense breast tissue is when the breast is filled more with kind of the connective tissue or glandular tissue and less fatty tissue. It's common, it's normal to have but dense breast tissue can increase your risk for breast cancer only because it can obscure or lower the sensitivity of a mammogram. So dense breast tissue, when you think of this, this is, you, you get your mammogram, it's an x-ray of your breast. Your breast tissue is gonna show up white on a black background. Glandular tissue is white on that black background. Anything that's abnormal in the breast is white. So if you have a lot of that white tissue already and there's an abnormality there, it's like looking for a snowman in a blizzard. So you won't find it. Um, when you have dense breast tissue, and everyone should ask when you're getting your mammogram if you need something called a 3D mammogram. It's a different, it's a new, the newest technology is a 3D mammogram such that instead of just an x-ray of one picture, it is actually a three-dimensional view of the breast. So you can see all the way around through that deep tissue. We are finding more cancers. We have patients that, have, that are coming back less for additional tests and therefore less false positives. So people are not getting biopsies when they don't need it because we have better pictures now of the breast. Um, and then one last thing just about dense breast tissue is that you can also request an ultrasound. Ultrasound is good as an adjunct to the mammogram when you have dense breast tissue to see and make sure nothing is missed and possibly the use of an MRI. So those are all things that you can ask your healthcare provider, a breast specialist. I have a high-risk clinic in my office, but I'm happy to see anybody also.
Yeah, I mean, this is, these are the kind of questions that we all need to know, knowing that, um, I mean, I'm a big believer in being your own advocate because there's so many times when sometimes doctors, they just, they've seen so many patients and they just want to lump you in with everyone else. And so being your own advocate, that is crucial and critical. And I think you gave us a lot of great questions that we can go forward with. Thank you so much, Dr. Bell. Yes. And Tanya, uh, so what are some things that you wish you had known before you were diagnosed? That you have options. There's more than one option. Just because a doctor tells you, suggests to you uh, to have one form of treatment, you should go out and research and find out what different treatments there are out there. There are some doctors that do things that others don't do. You would be amazed the difference that you would hear from one doctor to the next. So I would say get second opinions, even third opinions, if you feel like that you need that. And last quick question for both of you. So as far as finding those doctors, would you, how would you suggest that? I mean, finding those doctors to like listen to you. And um, I know, exactly, I thought you were like, <laughs> are you accepting your patients? I am, I have cards. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I think just about finding a doctor, you can start with your primary care doctor, your OBGYN, ask them, um, tell them you have questions, you want to just talk to a breast specialist. I have, my office is just down the street at Piedmont Hospital, and I treat breast cancer, but I also see benign breasts. I see patients who have high risk, who are high risk for various different reasons. I have a high risk breast clinic. Um, and so, and I just talk to patients who might have a question for breast pain, like something happened, it's different, and they just wanna know, is it okay? So you can always, always, always see somebody. You don't have to ignore it. You don't have to only just see your primary care doctor as well. You can come and see a specialist. So find somebody that you're comfortable talking to, get your questions answered, and be your own advocate. Do you have any uh, other last words, Tanya? Uh, really quick, a uh, couple things that I wrote down. Uh, when I, after my uh, treatment, and now I'm cancer-free of five years, which is... <laughs> daily do things and regimens to keep maintaining my, my, my status, but um, chlorella, chlorophyll are things that I, I do on a regular basis just to keep my pH, pH balance up, sorry. But one thing that you may want to be careful with, just make sure you don't have uh, seafood allergies because they are uh, from seaweed, they're extracted from the ocean. Um, apple cider vinegar, just add a little bit to your water, you can do that in bottled water, that's a great thing to do, keep your system going, keep flushing everything out, it also keeps your pH down as well. I love black seed oil, it's really good for the digestive system, for the immune system, respiratory system. Um, iodine in the form of kelp is really good, we don't realize that we don't get enough in our diets. That's something that I learned. I was definitely deficient in that. Vitamin D, um, if you can get one with the potassium um, uh, K2, K2 is, that's a really good one to add as well with your vitamin D because it helps the absorption. Uh, probiotics for women, very essential, especially if you're over 30. <laughs> Men too, actually, it helps with digestion. Um, and you know, another favorite of mine that you don't have to do depending upon your profession is garlic because you don't want to smell like it, but Garlic with honey is really good for allergy season right now, especially if you can do local honey. So those are a couple of things that I keep on a regimen and do it on a weekly basis. So I would suggest, you know, adding some of those to your diet. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to give them a round of applause. Dr. Bowman, Tanya Jones, thank you so much.